So I would love to thank you uh, all for being part of our journey to shed light on the sustainable solutions for peace. Um, we live in a world where the most peaceful nations on earth continue to become more peaceful, while the least peaceful places continue to deteriorate. At a time where the peace inequality gap continues to grow, we have a responsibility to take action and reverse this trend. We reverse this trend by protecting human rights for all people. We must start by engaging in positive conversations to build mutual understanding and embrace the discomfort of learning and evolving. Each time we collaborate and grow together, we actively promote peace equality. Together for Peace is a global platform for agents of change from all walks of life. We generate conversations that motivate, educate, and activate our online community to cultivate peace solutions that care. Together, we will globally fill the gap to solve peace inequality. Now, it's uh, my honor to introduce Marsha Hunt. Marsha Hunt is a creative writer, producer, Rotarian, Rotary Action Group for Peace member, facilitator for Mediators Beyond Borders, and active humanitarian. She is an Emmy award-winning producer by trade and has a heart for service, especially for the people of Uganda. Marsha is the CFO of the Uganda Development Initiative, an organization that provides quality primary and advanced education as well as medical care in Kanungu, Uganda. Multiple times each year, Marsha has been leaving the comfort of Los Angeles to visit some of the most remote villages of Uganda. After each planned ride and long drives to the rural uh, villages, the, she gives her time, energy, connections, knowledge, money, and heart into these special communities. Through her work with Uganda Development Initiative, she has rebuilt and supported four elementary schools a high school, a university program, and even establish a medical clinic for the Kanungu community. Marsha has helped countless children obtain the proper education for them to succeed and sustainably develop their community. Marsha supports eco-agriculture and small businesses led by the Uganda's youth to ensure the continued sustainable development of the Kanungu community. Her work in education and sustainable development has been so powerful that it has been recognized by the Uganda president himself and earned her an honorary doctorate from the prestigious Kanumba University in Kampala, Uganda. Not only is Marsha the embodiment of service above self, but she is a global mother. She has children of her own, but that was not a limitation for her to extend her motherhood to six more Ugandan children and countless others. Her Ugandan children are Catherine, Joanna, Joseph, Mercy, Africano, and Owen, as well as the lives of thousands of other precious other children. Marcia is an advocate for maternal and child health. In Kanungu, she has helped reduce the maternal death rate by 30%, thanks to UDI's new medical center. Marsha's care is her fuel for change. She is unstoppable and unintimidated by the challenges to peace, the remoteness, militarism, disease, and the lack of infrastructure. Her mission is to transform her care and empathy into impactful action. I would describe Marsha as an angel for peace. Her presence alone transcends peace to everyone around her especially the vulnerable children of Uganda. I cannot wait for you to experience Marsha's beautiful character and presence for yourselves. Now it's my honor to interview Marsha Hunt. Marsha, welcome. And I will start off by asking you um, the first question. So uh, you first came to Uganda as a missionary and you noticed the needs of the community there. Um, what was remarkable about the Kanungu uh, community? Why are there so many orphans there? Well, Kanungu at that time, and my very first, well, I started working here in the United States on it in 2003 and finding out more about it. And this was through my church um, 
in uh, Woodland Hills, California, Parents of Peace. And we um, were, were working and then a friend of mine who I met there said she was gonna go there one day and said she was gonna go in May of 2004 and did anybody wanna go with her? And I just popped up and said, yeah, I'll go with you. And then I was going, who said that? You know, I didn't know. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll go anywhere once. And so I went there, but at that time, what we had learned is that it was probably about the most depressed area of Uganda, which was one of the most depressed countries, still recovering from Eni Amin uh, in that area. But in that particular area, in two, I think it was 2000 or 2001, there was a horrible, horrible massacre right there in Kanungu, where some, as I understand, some people from the Congo came in and presented themselves as uh, as church leaders and were, you know, these these people and they were telling them, you know, you need to give every all of your possessions to us. The world's going to end on March 17th in 2001 or whatever. And uh, um, and they people literally they were so believing in these people. It was sort of like a Jim Jones thing, so they weren't committing suicide, but they gave them their possessions and they said, I'll oh, come into the church, got everybody into the church, and they set the church on fire. And over a thousand people were killed in that church. And um, then there were other, found other bodies elsewhere and everything, but these were just horrible, horrible people that never got caught, never got caught. So with a thousand people in a community like this, you can imagine that everybody knew someone. Everybody, you know, had a friend or a family member that was, that was there. And this one man literally said to me well, when we were in Kanungu, he said, nothing good can ever happen in Kanungu. Nothing good can ever happen in Kanungu. And, um, but I met the people there and they were so filled with, um, they they wanted things to get better they just they wanted things to get better for their children all these parents just really wanted to improve life you know for their children and um we originally went there our, our church there were six of us that went on that first mission and um we started building a a uh, a, a building that they wanted to have a college you know they wanted to have a college there um, and we started building a building with Legos there in Woodland Hills, California. And as our Lego building was going up, we were selling every Lego for $10 and some people were buying one Lego and some people were buying five and 10 and a hundred and so on and so forth. And as our Lego building was going up and up and up, the real building was going up and up and up because we were sending money over there. And then we actually went over to christen that building. They called it the Prince of Peace building. And, uh, and that was at the time for, I think it was called uh, uh, Chinchisi Community College. And um, the first classes were held under trees, you know, there was no, no place to hold them. But teachers came, professors came and they were teaching classes under tree. So then they had a building. And then, um, so that was basically my first trip. And I went as a missionary and then we were, we went to another area also and did some missionary work there. But as I said, if, when I was like 19 years old, if you'd told me, well, one of these days you're going to go to Africa as a missionary, you're going to be a missionary in Africa, you know, I think I would have been extremely surprised, you know, to hear you say that, you know, but uh, life changes, things change, people change. And so there I was in 2004 in Uganda. And when you went there as a missionary, you've noticed something else. You've noticed uh, this village. Uh, that um, and people in the village who built those mud schools, schools that made, oh, yes. yeah, uh -huh. you mm -hmm. noticed that Uganda needed much more help than what you thought you were offering. So can you tell us about the story of the community, why they built those mud schools and mm -hmm. what these mud schools served? Okay. Yeah. Well, this was on, on my, my second trip, you know, and um, uh, I, didn't know I was going to take that second trip, but uh, as life happens, I, I went there and um, they asked me to come, come back because I had been talking about things that needed to happen. And so members of the community, there was a school already in Kanungu called Chirima that they were 
you know, working on and their children going there. And, um, but some of the locals took me out to the, another little town about 40 minutes away called Nick, uh, Nickabungo. And they showed me this school and it was all made out of mud and sticks and, and every time it rained, some of those mud and sticks kind of drifted away, you know? So it was a, a temporary structure, but it, um, they built it because all these orphans just started arriving in Nickabungo. These orphans, you know, were arriving in Nickabungo for, uh, well, AIDS, obviously. They lost their parents due to AIDS, both of them. They, you know, it's a tough life there in Uganda. Sometimes, you know, people get, there's accidents, people get killed. Uh, some kids at that particular time, um, not a very pleasant story, but up in northern Uganda was uh, the Lord's Resistance Army, Joseph Cooney. I'm sure you've, you know, some of you have heard of the Lord's Resistance Army and Joseph Cooney, how they were kidnapping children. Just horrible, horrible stories, murdering parents, um, just horrible things happening. And, um, and children, some children escaped. If they didn't escape, if they tried to escape and got caught, they got killed immediately. But some children did escape because they didn't want to be child soldiers. They, you know, and some people, some of the children would go back to their town and their town would reject them because they knew they had done some horrible things while they were under Joseph Cooney's rule and killed other people. So they just started heading down south and some of them got to Nickabungo. Um, I think probably a lot, the vast, most of the kids were, you know, AIDS orphans, you know, at the time. But uh, there is every, there were many, many reasons. Those kids, and I don't know why they picked this one town. It's like a, a miracle or something. They just you know, started forming there. And so many kids started showing up that the people in the town, and these people had nothing, you know, they have nothing. But they we said, thought, we have to do something. It's not like they called the government or anything. They did it themselves. And they built a school for these children out of the mud and sticks, because that's all they had. They had some mud and they had some sticks, and they built a school. And some teachers that were teaching and getting paid at other schools quit their jobs at the paying schools and came and taught at Nickabungo. And when I got there, that first trip, on that trip, full school was in session. I was going from room to room and you could hear a pin drop in that room. There, you know, the children were paying such attention and they were, they were in this one class, they were talking about, um, you know, doing math, math problems and talking about uh, finances and all this sort of thing in this mud and hut school. I mean, I was really impressed with the level of, of education these children were getting. And, um, but, and while I was there, this one little girl showed up and she, as it turned out, obviously I couldn't speak her language. It was Ruchiga, but the teachers talked to her. She showed up barefooted, little tummy extended, you know, and um, her mother two days earlier, her father had already died and her mother had told her she had to go find Nickabungo now. Her mother was literally on her deathbed and told her that she had to go find Nickabungo. And this little girl, she was about seven maybe, walked two days by herself in Africa and found this school and showed up when I was there. And she was just the most timid little thing you ever saw and was scared and the teachers, you know, welcomed her and comforted her. First thing they did was give her some food and clean water, of course, you know. And then I've got some picture of them holding up uniforms next to her, you know, seeing which one might fit her. And they got a uniform on her. And then I saw her again. And I said, she looks much happier now. And the teacher said, one of the teachers said, she feels safe now. And um, so that little girl, you know, started the school there. I took a bunch of pictures and um, wrote up when I got back home. I wrote a whole story and sent it to uh, Rand Reasoner. He's uh, the, the head minister at uh, Prince of Peace Church in Woodland Hills. And I sent it to him and he called me on the phone and he said, you know what, would you mind if I sent this out to all the parishioners? And I said, no, go ahead. And he sent it out to all the parishioners. And then 
they sent it out to their friends and, and money started coming in to, I said I wanted to rebuild the school, you know, because it was falling apart. And we got about, I forget how much, about $50,000 or something together and got that whole school, got it rebuilt in about six months or something. Wow. So yeah. th this story is the story of care and generosity started with this community welcoming the children mm -hmm. who, who were, you know, orphans. And the, I, I read some of your articles about this and you said that the children would actually sleep uh, at night the, at those families' homes. So yeah. The, yeah, they took care of them. Um, mm -hmm. So they built them in the school and they hosted them afterwards. And there were many of them. Um, so my question to you, Marcia, did the UN or USID or any of those big organizations um, do anything to help you in, in any way? Uh, in a word, uh, no, uh, they, they did not. Um, I, have a, a pro, I guess there's a whole lot of things. I'm not a political person, and I'm not sure how all the politics work out, but no, we've been going through churches and rotary clubs and uh, synagogues have helped us and um, just private individuals that I've met, you know, and um, over the years. And it's not just me. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of people involved in getting all of this up and running. Um, half the people at Prince of Peace have been, you know, majorly involved in it for years. In fact, you know, I got involved with it because of Prince of Peace and my the work my friend Julie Fanton had done before me, before all of it, you know. Mm -hmm. What struck me was when I was reading some of the stuff about this uh, mud school that um, that there was UN vans passing through the, the yeah. village. Yeah, they've had there've been UN vans passing by. Yeah, no one they, stopped. They don't stop. Yeah, <laughs> they don't stop. They have a mission to go to that they've been assigned to, and they have to go to that mission. And I guess in this, they don't stop and look around. I don't know. I can't. I can't speak for the UN, but I've seen them pass by, but they don't stop. <laughs> But that's to me is a really important point to make because that means that the UN has a lot to do. Like there's the Rwandan genocide close to Uganda mm -hmm. border with Kunungu. There's yeah. all this stuff that they they are so busy focusing on all these other things, and that's where we humanitarians mm -hmm. um, and grassroots can come together and fill those gaps. And so mm -hmm. what you've done is that you filled the gap. The community tried to fill that gap on their own, but then you've um, brought more help and you've taken that initiative to involve more people to fill that gap. So thank you, Marsha. Uh, now, mm -hmm. I want to ask you about like some of the beneficiaries of those schools that you, you didn't only rebuild one school, you rebuilt four over the time. Um, and you were going back and forth to Uganda and in one of your trips, um, you've stumbled into um, a banana forest. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the children of the banana forest story. Why did you go to Uganda that one time and how did you? What's well, the story, yeah. There again, back to Prince of Peace Church in Willow Hills, um, the parishioners had raised money to buy some acres, um, about $20,000, I think, and to buy some acreage that was near the college and that we could uh, have a t tea farm on. And so we got, got the acreage built and and the seedlings, you know, for the for the tea farms and everything, and they were planting it. And while I was there, I went. I wanted to walk out and kind of do my due diligence since I was there and take pictures to take back to the church. Of well, it's actually here. It's really happening, you know. <laughs> and uh, um, so um, my friend uh, Kellen and Sarah, who was uh, one of the nurses at uh, Tarima School one of our nurses that goes around from school to school, we, they were walking with me out there to show it to me. And um, it was just a beautiful sight. They're, you're talking about the colorful clothes or all these women. And women are traditionally the farmers there and have been for centuries and centuries. Um, and they're out there and planting the seedlings and, and the little tiny trees and everything. And it was just like this, they said, there it is. And I looked up. And it was just like, I felt like some sort of crescendo of music starting. It was just like this beautiful sight I saw of the, the rows and rows of the, for the tea farm and everything. 
and took some pictures. And then we were going back, we went a different way through this banana forest. And I found, literally almost tripped over this one little boy, um, these four little, four kids in this banana, living in this banana forest. They had another mud hut and stuff, you know, dirt floor. And there was like a, I figured about an 11 year old, 10 or 11 year old girl there. And she seemed to be taking care of the other three. And I was trying to find out what's going on. And Kellen was talking to them and Rachida. I want to stop you for a moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want you to describe to us how did you find them? How did they look like? How, okay. what condition they were in? So we can actually rub our heads around okay. that. Well, they were literally in rags, you know, and um, this, they were barefooted, you know, had never worn shoes. Um, the 11 year old had never gone to school at all and they had never slept in a bed and or you know and uh, they're just really you know grubby grubby beyond like kids like you know your own kids or grandkids that might go out and play and get all dirty and come in this was like dirt deep rubbed into their skin you know and um uh and had you know sores and things on them their little tummies not, you know, sticking out and stuff. And um, uh, just, it was about the saddest thing I ever saw, you know. And um, so we wanted to find out, you know, well, is somebody gonna come back here and take care of them or, and I said, well, to Kellen, I said, look, now that we know these kids are here, we know they're here, we can't just say, oh, isn't this a shame and walk away. You know, I know they're here. I can't just, we can't just walk away from them and um they're children and the one little boy the youngest one i almost tripped over he didn't have a name nobody knew when he was had been born you know he didn't have a birthday nobody you know just you know, kind of like tarzan no name just kind of found you know and um uh my understand and he we figured from looking at him that he was about four years old just from looking at his hands his kind of level of maturity and how you know he was you know viewing things and his coordination and everything that he was about four and um and so i told him i said well let's you know should we take him with him and kellen said well we have to find out if this is all true you know first um that we don't want to take somebody's kids you know and she said, and we'll, I'll send someone up here to check out all of this, you know, this whole situation. And then um, we'll come back tomorrow. And I said, well, tell this, the oldest girl that we'll be back tomorrow. I'll tell her we're going to come back tomorrow, no matter what. And, um, and she said, okay, I'll tell her we'll come back tomorrow. So Kellen did send someone up to check well, out the story. I, wanna, yeah. I, I want you to express to me how impressive. So the youngest, the oldest girl is Joanna. Joanna. And, and Joanna was the caregiver. Joanna. Yeah, was the, the caregiver. caregiver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the caregiver for three other children. She was only 11. She was 11. And yes. she had nothing to care yeah. for them. She kept yeah. them alive. She kept them alive. Wow. And wow. she lived at 11 years old. My understanding is when she was about eight um, or so, that somebody handed her the little one when he was a baby. Huh. Just handed her and she took them, kept them alive. And um, I've actually been, uh, you know, WhatsApp, I've been on WhatsApp with them, you know, about five times today. And, uh, but uh, anyway, <laughs> um, she kept him alive. And um, so we were coming back. She found out this, Kellen found out the story is all true. Those are kids, they're orphans, they're up there. And I said, well, we can go back and can we get them into Tarima school? And Hamlet said, we have to have sponsors. And I said, don't worry about sponsors. We'll have sponsors, you know, for now, you know, get, we'll, you know, it's the least of our worries is sponsors right now. We just got to get these kids into a decent place where they can live and survive and be fed and, you know, cared for. And um, so it's important, Marsha, to highlight that if you actually didn't find sponsors for them because probably they wouldn't be cared for and like how much does it cost for a child to be sponsored and and sponsorship give them education uh, food and clothing and shelter how much does it cost uh, per child it's, 
uh, $250 a year right now, 250 a year. And you can change a child's life for $250 and it, a year. I did not, it, it, it creates a miracle is what I say in that child. For that child, it creates a miracle. Okay. And um, so, so you found, you said, I found them sponsors. Let's just give them back to the school yeah. and take care of them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I said, don't worry about, I'll get them sponsors. <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry about it. And so when we went back, it was like this whole, we talked to the headmaster, the screamer, and there was this whole like parade of people going back. There was me, Kellen, her husband, Hamlet. There was the headmaster of the school. There was Sarah again, the school nurse, and Annette, who is in charge of the girls' dormitory. Wonderful, wonderful woman. I loved her dearly. And um, so there was this parade of people, and the, and the men were all in their suits. Men dress up in Uganda. They're all in their suits and white shirts and ties and black shoes. And, and I always wear, you know, everybody wears, women wear skirts there most of the time when you're, you know, just walking around and everything. I was actually in a skirt. And so we came walking and started walking up this hill toward the banana forest. And jo Joanne came out and she, uh, the forest, and she saw us um, coming up that hill. And she just started jumping up and down and laughing and just like so thrilled and ran in and told the other kids, the, the two five-year-olds, you know, and, and, and they came out and just jumping up and down and so thrilled, you can't believe it. And um, it was one of those, you know, life-changing moments in my life, you know, where I kind of knew I'd be coming back to Uganda a lot, you know, or for a while at any rate. And um, so we got up there and um, took them to, to Kellen's house. Well, let's, let's actually digest this. So mm -hmm. this is such a beautiful moment because you made a promise to Joanna that you're gonna come the next day. Mm -hmm. And she probably had people, you know, she couldn't believe that someone actually cared enough that they will show up. And then she saw you, she was obviously anticipating that you're coming. And then their, her joy, like just to see you, and I know that you probably were in tears, Marcia. You couldn't. <laughs> I don't know. Describe how you felt. It was a pretty emotional moment. <laughs> I saw her jumping up and down on that hill, you know. Yeah, uh, and then you knew that was the moment that that you 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 will be um, tied to Uganda probably forever, um, mm -hmm. which is the case. You've been mm -hmm. going back and forth forever. Um, okay, so tell us um, then what happened next. Well, we took them to Kellen's house, and uh, uh, Annette and the school nurse, um, told, they took them out into the, the backyard. They were going to bathe them first, and they told me to go inside or do something, because they said, this is not going to be pretty, you know, because <laughs> they had so much, they were just dirt ground into them, you know, and so I said, well, I'll go get them Kellen and I, I'll go get them some clean clothes to put on after you're done. They said, this is going to take a while, you know. So um, I went into town, beautiful downtown Canunga there, and got some, um, we got some clothes for them, you know, clean clothes, brand new. And um, I couldn't get him any shoes, obviously, because I needed their feet to get dry shoes on. So we brought the clothes back. And gave them to Sarah and Danette and so then they came into Ke Kellen's house all cleaned up and in their clothes they were just looking at each other and laughing their heads you know so hard their heads off and then this was just like sat down at Kellen's dining room table and they brought out you know jam and or honey and jam and bread and mil milk and you know things to eat and all of that and sitting at a table and they were just looking at each other at the table sitting there first time they'd ever sat at a table you know and um just you know got the such giggles and everything and then when they were through eating we went to back to town to get them some shoes and them getting shoes was I'll never forget that because they'd never had shoes on before. And I don't think they liked the clothes. I don't think they liked it. They did not like the shoes right <laughs> now. The shoes were, you know, they could have done without the shoes. They just weren't used to it. Just, you know, and they were like looking at their feet and lifting up their feet and, and you know, grimaces on their face. <laughs> what is this? Do I have to wear these? Yes, <laughs> you know, kind of face. And 
it was, the shoe situation was, was and just them walking in them at first or picking their feet up real high and taking each step very individually. And um, so that was their, their shoe experience, you know. And then they went, went to the school. Oh, we also got, I got them, um, you know, beds and blankets and sheets and, you know, everything for, uh, to, to go to take to school. And, uh, the, and uh, well, Sarah and Annette were there, so they knew exactly what to get. So we were getting all of that and soaps and toothbrushes. Oh, that was like, what do you do with this? You know, what is this? Tooth, you know? <laughs> and um, uh, so anyway, got them everything they needed. And they went to the school and um, the uh, Owen and, got to go in the boys dorm and Mercy and um, Joanne got to go in the girls dorm. But but Joseph, well, his name wasn't even Joseph yet then. It was still the boy. Got uh, had went and lived with Annette in her quarters for like the first year or so, year or year and a half, because he was too little to go to the dorm. And um, so that's where he. And so they were set up and taken care of, and uh, that was our our day in the our afternoon in the banana forest. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Marcy, can you tell us how much? time did it take uh for the school to help them clean up and like what what kind of they had worms they had oh you know, yeah they had yeah. um the school nurse well after they got to the to the school the she told me she was going to give them this mixture i'm not sure what it was but they knew how to deal with it you know um a mixture because they she she knows they have the worms and so they gave it to them and over the next couple of days she said she never in her life saw so many worms come out of children. They were just filled. They probably wouldn't have survived, you know, you know, much longer out there. And they were just filled with worms. And pretty quickly, like their, their tummies went down and, you know, they started looking, you know, you know. Healthy. Yeah, a little, you know, healthier and everything. And they had some I took them to this medical center in, in Buendi to get checked out because Mercy had something on her head that looked like a, like a bug bite that got infected or something. And Joseph had something on his toe. And I just wanted to get all four of them just a once over, you know, by a doctor. And f through Rotary, um, this uh, gentleman, Dr. Kellerman, he was um, at the, in a Santa Barbara Rotary Club. And um, he had started a medical center in Buendi where he had started treating people under a tree and then it got grew and grew and grew and grew, you know? And so we got him checked out. There were two doctors there from England and um, they, ch they checked him out. And I think Mercy had to take some antibiotics or something for a week or so. <laughs> and uh, uh, Joseph's toe, they just cleaned it up and fixed it. But um, um, tell us about the trip when you took Mercy and Joseph to the uh, where he he knew his name. How, oh, how how did he pick his name? Yeah, Joseph chose his own name. He was sitting on my lap in the car. All four of them went, and our driver Nicholas, who still when I go there, he still drives for me and stuff. Um, he uh, he said that that jo that he was smart little boy because he's trying to pick up on everything you say, and um, he's trying to understand and he's trying to repeat some of it, you know, <laughs> and. I was going through names. I said, well, you have to have a name if, you know, and I was, I said, Dwight. And I said, uh, Dwight, Jim, and he didn't want Dwight or Jim. And that was my brothers. And I uh, wanted uh, and checked out, oh, I was going through cousins, you know, Jeff, uh, Troy, and, you know, <laughs> Josh, going through every name I know. Then I went to work, uh, you know, and started saying, okay, well, there's Robert, there's, um, um, Oh, just going through a bill, you know, all these names. I went through like a hundred names. Every guy I knew in high school, every guy I ever knew in my life. And he was, he was just kept going, no, 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 I didn't like, didn't like the sound of that. And then I, I thought of my uncle Joseph and I said, Joseph, I said, uh, Joseph. And he sat up and he, he smiled and he said, Joseph. <laughs> and I said, are you Joseph? And he said, Joseph, you know, <laughs> just like that. And I said, well, I guess that's who you are. You're Joseph. Right. And um, so that's how he, he picked his own name. And then his middle name is Mark. He picked out Mark for his middle name. 
Yeah. And that was the first time he smiled at you. He wasn't, he wasn't happy. Yeah. yeah, he was kind of, he was kind of leery about me. Kellen, Kellen actually said, you're probably the first white person he's ever seen, you know? And um, so he was a little uh, afraid of me. I think he was a little afraid of me. And um, I've had that happen before around little kids when I've been out there. They look at me and just start screaming, you know, terrified. And I'll, I'll like, walk away and try not to, not try not to scare them. But I guess I could look pretty scary. If, uh, you know, you've never seen somebody like me before. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. So that's a beautiful story. It's just fascinating, like, what we consider to be so... Um, we take for granted our names that sometimes mm -hmm. people have to find their own name. Like that's for a child to name himself is, is really heartbreaking to, mm -hmm. and because of the circumstances and the, the, the journey he was on. But um, that's a beautiful story, Marcia. It was a beautiful story. So I want to go back to Joanna. Um, later, Joanna thrived in the school mm -hmm. and, um, and she, I believe, wants to be a lawyer someday. Uh, she wants to be a businesswoman. A businesswoman. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> she is a businesswoman. Yeah. So, so yeah. one of your visits, um, you always check on Joanna. Like you go back and forth, and you spend almost every day with them. Um, you've heard the news about a lump on her um, um, skull, and that wouldn't go away. So, can you tell us the miracle of network and how Rotary, uh, in a literally, saved Joanna's life, basically with us? <laughs> with all the good mm -hmm. people involved. Tell us the miracle of, mm -hmm. of, of Joanna. Well, so I, I, you know, showed up and I went up to Charima school where they live and everything. And they all came running. And then uh, Sarah, the nurse came out and she said, you know, look at Joanna's head. And she's got this bump on her. And I first said, well, how long she had this? She had a few months. And I, and Joanna said, I have headaches. I have headaches. You know, she was speaking English pretty she was getting a lot better at it. She said, headaches. And um, I said, you know, did you get hit by something? Did you get hit by a rock? Or she said, no, no, nice. And I had to ask the question, nobody hit you, did they? Nobody did this to you? And he said, no, 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 no. Um, and, um, and I said, a ball hit you or anything? And, you know, none of that. And so I decided to take her over back to the Buindi because we had no medical center in Canunga then. And um, so we went back to Buindi to get, see if we get a checkup. There was a Ugandan doctor there. And what had happened is that um, just before I got there, um, four rotary clubs in Nevada had gotten together and gotten this x-ray machine, um, you know, built and it was actually like inside of a train, you know, um, train wagon or something, you know, that you would, people cart in cart things around in and it had just arrived and they had just gotten it all set up and, and everything and she was like one of the first people to get an x-ray with it and um so she got the x-ray and this ugandan young woman doctor came out um and told me that this was not an innocent bump not an innocent bump and um and she needed to go to see other doctors in Kampala or something, you know? And I said, okay, not innocent. And so um, I told her, you know, everything's gonna be fine. And, you know, um, and so we got her up to Kampala and, oh, actually, you know, what happened was then we took the x-rays and this young guy, he was 22 years old. He was down, for, he had just graduated from college and, um, he was down there, he was working with the university students and, and trying to do some things with them. And it just so happened that both of his parents were doctors. And, and also one thing I was working on then, I was trying to get some way to get internet, some internet access out there. And I had my computer, of course, and um, I bought a, 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 just happened to buy a printer when I was in Kampala that had a scanner and everything so I could scan things into my computer and um we scanned the x-rays in and then emailed them to his both of his parents in cambridge england and then another miracle 
just so happened one of their good friends happens to be the tropical disease expert at University of London. And so they sent the x-rays to him and he diagnosed it. He asked if this child was ever malnourished. And I said, well, you know, we found her when she was 11, you know, so I imagine before then she was pretty malnourished. And um, um, so he thought it was this kind of a lymphoma that children who have been malnourished will get some, you know, will get. And he said, this is what it looks like to me. And she needs to have surgery immediately, immediately. She won't survive a month if she doesn't have surgery. And I'm sitting there in Uganda going, oh my God, what, you know. So um, my friend Hamlet is a big time Rotarian and he has groups up in Kampala. And so we went up to Kampala, found out there were only three, now I'm not a, a medical doctor, <laughs> you know, brain surgeons, you know, people look at, go into a head. There's probably 30 at University of Portland, 30 at UCLA, 30 at Cedar sinai you know, we can find them, you know, but there were three in the entire country. And then it just so happened um, that one of them was a Rotarian. One of those guys was a Rotarian. And so he said he'd do the, sur he, he did the surgery for free. I still had to pay the hospital, which was, and I, and I was like busted by then. I was, you know, I had, um, and I put the word out at Prince of Peace Church and money came in. Um, it was like an, ama an amazing thing. Sue Farron sent me over a thousand dollars, got it over a thousand dollars to me and other people donated and we got the hospital bill to pay for. And so they did the surgery. He was, that doctor was in her head for five hours and um, got it out and say la vie. Now she's thriving. She has a little scar in her head, but, uh, but uh, she's doing, doing great. Yeah. And you found the doctor in two hours because the rotary network, like that, that was yeah. amazing. Yeah, Hamlet. Me. I guess put the word out and I sent, I can't remember, how, I think I sent him the x-rays too. And so he may have been showing them or something, but you know, so this one rotary doctor did the surgery. Yeah. It's, it's pretty it's, uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Like, so in the entire country, there's only three neurosurgeons. There were, yeah, yeah. There then, you know, <laughs> at the time. And I was just, you know, just panicked because I, when this Ugandan doctor said this bump is not innocent. And then, the British doctors were diagnosing and, you know, from a distance. And then, so we had to get her up to Kampala. And, every, and so anyway, it, it all came together. It seems like there was just like one miracle after another miracle after another miracle. And it's like, God definitely had plans for Joanne. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, she was only 14 at the time too. Wow. She was a 14 year old girl. How old is she now? How old is Joanne? Oh gosh, she's in about 25 now. Wow, mm -hmm. that's awesome. So um, now you have a medical center. You built a medical center uh, close to uh, uh, Kanungu. Uh, yeah. Or in Kanungu. Well, so tell us about the story. Why did you build the medical center? What does it serve? What well, does it do? Okay. It, it's with all of these things. It's not just me. It's a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of different countries, you know. And um, anyway. So uh, there are these buildings up there that, I, in the, as the story goes, in 1938, the British built some, some buildings, built a small medical center for the British people that were there growing coffee, the plantation owners, that, you know, that sort of thing. And um, so those buildings were there, but um, in the 70s, Idi Amin's troops came through and just, uh, all but destroyed, you know, took anything of value right out of the wall, anything, you know, anything they thought they could sell, door handles, name something, just everything was, was just completely ransacked, you know, and, but the buildings were still there, you know, and so some of the, the midwives that were there started, started using them and to deliver babies. There's no power, there's no nothing. They just had, they just set up shop there kind of thing, you know, and started, <laughs> started delivering the babies there. And then um, they started, you know, doing a couple of other things, but it was just like, you know, a grubby mess. I certainly, 
well, there's some of the pictures there. Uh, the floors were, I mean, you can almost you can see machine guns, you know, where things, <laughs> bullets where things had been shot up and stuff like that. And um, um, it wasn't, you know, the greatest of circumstances. And um, we wanted to try to do, you know, something to get, get it all rebuilt and, and or some of the rooms fixed up. And then um, some people told me about uh, this young doctor in, uh, that lived in Germany, Dr. Holger Listel, and he and I just started communicating. I got his email address and he and I just started communicating back and forth. And then as the world would have it, he was coming from somewhere else and I was going from Kanungu into Paris and he, he said he could swing by Paris on his way home. And we actually met in Paris, you know, and, um, and just started talking about what we, you know, could do and what needed to happen. And he told me about this uh, rotary club called Mimingem and that was in, um, in um, Germany, obviously. And he said, you should go, you know, talk to them and see what they'll say. And so I actually uh, went in and, and spoke to them and uh, he knew them. He knew like a lot of them. He told me to talk to this doc Dr. Holger, I mean, Dr. Hol Holson or, yeah. And um, so I met with them and, you know, told him about this and I, and they said, well, and they wound up giving, like, getting, Holder said we needed an actual brand new surgery center and everything. And they actually wound up getting the money together and built the sur to build the surgery center. And Holder put in some of his own money, too. And I put in some of my own money for, toward the um, solar power and stuff, you know. And, um, but, this is, and we fixed up the other rooms uh, where the, um, women were staying and the midwives were and um, they didn't have any doctors there because doctors couldn't do anything you know there was nothing they could do there was no surgery center and um, but they said and we talked with the government and I spoke with people at the government and Holger spoke with people at the government and there's our medical center there and uh, <laughs> our surgery center all looking beautiful there and in Kanungu and um, you know, we just kind of got everything together. We got some money from the government, and we um, and once they knew we had a uh, surgery center that they could operate out of, we have two full time doctors there now too, wow. and um, and Holger goes there every now and then. <laughs> and um, um, and I had this except for COVID. Uh, this one, this very close friend of mine, Lisa Lisa Weiss, and she's been sponsoring one of the kids for years and years and years, and. Um, um, from Fox Sports, she has a friend who is a plastic surgeon in Santa Monica, and he um, will come there and do, you know, there are kids there to do the uh, facial problems, cleft palates, you know, that sort of thing, and um, he'll do those surgeries once things, people can start traveling again, and um, so he'll come and do that, we'll set that up, and, but there's two full-time doctors, and Holger actually called me, I was in Los Angeles, I think it was about three in the morning or something, my time, and he called me and said, the hospital, the doctor, they just delivered the first C-section in, in, in Kanengu, you know, ever delivered. Because what used to have to happen is the midwives would be delivering a baby, and then if there was a complication, they had to, um, while this woman is in labor, you know, and in a dangerous situation, um, they have to get a car, get gas, sometimes there's no gas in the town, um, and go to either Imbarara, which is about three and a half hours away, or go over to um, Kabali, which is about two and a half hours away. And Kabali's up and down over these huge hills, that, you know, 5,000 foot drops and everything. And if it's raining, it, you, you know, you can't, the roads can be impassable. Um, you know, all kinds of, of problems. And that's, unfortunately, some women didn't make it, some babies didn't make it, and it was a huge, huge problem. We did bring the maternal death rate down with the midwives when we got, we organized getting the word out to all these, you know, families up in the mountains. There are no roads going up there. You just have to kind of walk up there 
and they have little pieces of land they'll they farm or and whatever and um most of them live in mud huts nobody has a car and you, well, what would happen is they would wait until they went into labor and then start walking into Kanungu to the midwives so we got the word out when you think you're about two weeks away from having your baby start walking into Kanungu now and there's a dormitory there and you and your younger children can stay in that dormitory and then when you go into labor you're there already you know instead of trying to walk 10 miles while you're in labor and uh, so that in itself brought the maternal death rate down um, but it's been you know quite a sections you've done how many C-sections? Well, I heard just recently, and I get notes from uh, Martin, who is my main, oh, I'm on the phone, okay. <laughs> um, he just uh, texted me that uh, they had a meeting, but anyway, they've done about, this is since like February, I guess, about 125 C-sections there. One reason is because now in other areas where they might've sent the woman to Imbarara or another air, town or something, Kanungu's closer so they can send them to Kanungu. So now we're one of the places that people are sent to, you know? Yeah. So that's why there have been so many in a few months, you know, there. What are the needs for the medical <coughs> center right now? Uh, that well, you, Yeah. My very, my first need that is something I just want to get more than try to figure this out get it as yesterday as soon as possible as an anesthesiology machine because then that'll open up a lot of other surgeries they could do with the c-sections which i had a c-section and have you can do an epidural you know and deliver the baby but obviously there's other surgeries that's that's not going to work and um so my the big thing is i'd like to get uh, well on holger too that's on his list that's our first thing on the list for the medical how much, how much does it cost to get that uh to the it's about fifteen thousand dollars in this town called Imbarara, where you send people uh there is a, a medical school in fact some doctors at ucla have actually gone to Imbarara, oh, you know a few years ago and all and worked there and um but there's a place in Imbarara that um it's called joint medical center and they we can get all our medical supplies there and then then it's you know they'll service it they'll you know it's you know we don't have to order it from europe or anything we can get it right there and and that company will take care of it you know and do the servicing and maintenance and everything on it so that's that. and you also need you also mm -hmm. need an ultrasound machine and but most an ultrasound. holger was able to get one ultrasound machine a used one and we'd like to get another one because where the surgery center is and where the women's, you know, and the midwives and the dorm and everything is and are, it's up a hill, you know? And so we don't want to be taking this machine up and down, you know, this hill. It's not like you can put it on an elevator and go up and, you know, you have to carry it up yeah. and down. So yeah. having two ultrasound machines would, would be ideal. We have one, but it's much better we need a second one and so first would be the the uh, anesthesiology machine and second would be the ultrasound machine. and do you need you need volunteers doctors like for any doctor who's a rotarian or doctors beyond borders they yeah. can be in contact yeah. with development mm -hmm. uganda development initiative correct yeah if they have you know there's a, a specialty or if they're just gonna be there and they'd like to go and see it that would be wonderful if they have a, a specialty well like you know the plastic surgeon that can do the cleft palates you know um we will we would we or we would already we're gonna organize a whole thing so he can be there for you know a few days and just have the surgeries lined up so he can kind of do keep a make the most of his time while he's there you know if there's you know a uh you know, different kinds of, you know, surgeons that we could line up the people that are the kind of people that he would, would see for, you know, you know, fix broken bones or fix, I mean, our bones that did were broken and didn't heal right. You'll see that a lot where somebody's arm is, leg is really messed up. And um, cause you know, the leg got broken, the arm got broken and it just, you know, 
got no attention really to it and they fixed it themselves or something. But, um, um, you know, there's, you know, a lot of different specialties. So if somebody has a specialty and they would like to, you know, help out, we can, we can set that up. <laughs> Thanks, Marsha. Now I want to talk briefly with you about the seed program because your model is really to have sustainable development in Uganda through education. So you have primary, elementary, high school, and uh, college. And uh, you also have agriculture, eco, agri, like, so you want the community to sustain itself. You're very involved. You're not just throwing money at the projects and not, you're very, very involved. And you want to ensure that the community can sustain and evolve in, on its own. And you're there to just nurture that. So can you tell us about the seed program? Like what, what is it um, and what's the story of the seed program? Well, the seed program stands for uh, science education to enhance development. And um, what they wanna do is bring in teach, uh, people who wanna be teachers and teachers who are teaching now, bring them in and you know, teach them how to teach science and math and, and all of this, and then send them back out into different areas of Uganda. And um, what that program is, it was started by these um, wonderful, wonderful people, Paul and Jessica Schindel, and they're actually out of the Boston area. And um, they, it was their idea and they're, they're, they're kind of their child, you know? And um, they, uh, came and said, you know, we can work with your group, you know, because we need to have pe a place where people can donate money for it and um, or do stock options. And uh, sometimes they want to donate stock options. And so uh, actually a guy in my Rotary Club, Brian, um, Brian Whitney actually takes care of when people want to make stock donations. Um, he takes care of that for us. I just, I just call him, Brian, I have somebody who wants to donate some stock. <laughs> he said, okay, give me that. And he takes it from there and then we get a check, you know, <laughs> or they transfer it into our account. And uh, um, so thank you, Brian, if you're listening. And um, uh, so we got the, uh, started looking around for where to put this building. We found a spot, it's on the campus. and. Um, we had a big celebration on the groundbreaking of it. And actually the prime minister of Uganda at that time um, came out for it because we were starting to get some publicity. I don't know, not that I was doing anything, but publicity was happening. And then there's the seed program, then there's the seed building and it's got solar power there. And um, so obviously not much is happening right now because of COVID, but, um, but, you know, they're working on training and getting uh, scholarships for kids or teachers or whoever to, to come there. And um, it's just a, you know, a great, a great program. And uh, it's something that's been, um, you know, the brainchild I said of, of uh, Jessica and Paul Schindel. And uh, it has been helping not only our community, but we can send teachers out into other areas too. Yeah, and mm -hmm. how is the university uh, where the seed program exists was different from other universities? Do they have even what a university has? Like, did they have, um, I, I believe they struggled to even have internet access at some point. Yeah, it's a constant struggle, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And um, um, it, it's different. Well, it started when it was originally Chinchisi Community college when we were building that Prince of Peace building. And then we got a Father Brian um, uh, dining hall and um, a library built. And this friend of mine, Sue Farron, who sent the money for Joanne, she's been out there a few times. Um, she's been going to Prince of Peace for a long time too. And she's been out there a few times uh, to put the library together. And she got a computer that she brought out from the States to give to the librarian there and showed him, you know, how to, you know, do the system and everything, basically taught him how to run a library, you know. And um, she was the head librarian. Uh, there's a high school in the San Fernando Valley, Grant High School. And for a long time, she was like the head librarian of that high school there. So she had a lot of experience in libraries. And, um, and she, you know, got that library together and we're still, 
you know, getting, you know, books. Um, they have to be Ugandan. It, not just any books will do because they have to be the re Ugandan curriculum, you know, to follow to yeah. be right. So, you know, we have to still working on always working on getting trying to get money for the library too. And um, but I think a lot you see it, LA is always working on money, <laughs> getting donor people to donate money too, not just us. And um, so. And we have, you know, we have Echo Agriculture is one of the courses you can take. I mean, one of the um, programs you can follow. Um, Echo Tourism, because tourism is the largest, um, it's the largest industry in Uganda, because they have, you know, the gorillas and elephants. They have, you know, they have all all the animals. And uh, so tourism is the largest in industry. There's no car factory, you know, there's no real factories there in Uganda, and. Uh, we're big on entrepreneurialism too, because um, the young people know better than I know or what anybody else knows of, um, um, let me decline this call right now. Um, had a, somebody trying to call me, <laughs> declined it. Um, uh, you know, there's no factories. And so we're trying, uh, entrepreneurialism is a big deal. We're, we want the kids to be an entrepreneur and like Joanne was we were talking about she would maybe like to have you know start a uh, a uh, shop like an ace hardware you know um or home depot not not quite as big you know than a little place 10 by 10 but could, where people can go get supplies for building and in fact um one of the kids um uh owen would like to be a builder and that's what he's interested in and I think this next generation, it's a good time to be a builder because the next generation, their generation, will see a lot more buildings going up, houses actually being made from things other than mud and sticks, you know, yeah. schools being built from other than mud and sticks and all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a beautiful story. Marsha, like uh, there is a, an opportunity for young people in the U.S. Mm -hmm. to help connect with uh, young people in uh, uh, Kanungu and Uganda. Um, so can you tell us uh, about the opportunities for volunteering or an example of uh, a student from the U.S. who helped um, and volunteered in Uganda and how did that happen? Yes, well, um, it's pretty well known at UCLA that I'm the Uganda lady, you know, <laughs> and, so, and they, they contact me. I usually um, uh, speak to, um, you know, the, the rotor actors and, uh, you know, every year. And is that they they all kind of know me and um, um, so this a couple of times this one young woman Tiffany Tiffany Hasu and she wanted to go to Uganda and in fact my Rotary Club the Westwood Village Rotary Club I think donated some money to help her with her plane ticket to get over there and she was just a real go getter she stayed there after I was gone she, I have actually have a small house there. Um, about as big as the room I'm in right here, but uh, <laughs> it's right across the street from the college. And when I'm not there, like visiting professors or somebody, you know, they stay there. And um, um, we, uh, so she went and she stayed like for six weeks, you know, stayed there. And she went and taught, taught at the high school. She was helping with the, I, I think it was math and science, you know, helping at the high school. And, uh, and she she loved it there, and um, uh, and now she Tiffany is now a nurse living in um, I think it's Pennsylvania. She lives in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania now, and is a nurse at a major hospital. And but that was she always says that was one of the greatest experiences. And then in 2018, the a young girl who was president of the Rotary Club of the Rotaractors at UCLA, McKinsey um went uh went with me and uh we actually met up in um in europe and then flew to together to um in tebe and um so she just she went around and she she was just there while i was there you know hanging around with me and she went to nikabungo and saw the kids my rotary club has four kids that they 
have been sponsoring for years. And in fact, just last night, they voted in the board meeting to sponsor them again this year. Yes, thank you, Westwood Village Rotary Club. Thank you. And um, <laughs> they've been sponsoring them for quite a while for, for the same four kids. And um, so, and that created a miracle in their life. And so she met those kids and she uh, met, um, she went to Nickabungo and saw the kids at, I mean, at Namorama and saw some of the kids at Namorama and saw the hospital. She actually came to one of these, a uh, meeting we had um, at the hospital, as I recall, or oh, about the hospital. She went to Kabali with me and we spoke to some people about it there. And um, she had a, you know, she had a, a great time. We went to a few Rotary Club meetings and all of that and, um, and to Wendy. And, but um, she met uh, jo Joanne and she met, you know, some of the kids, uh, Joseph, I think, you know, some of the kids that have been around Mercy and saw the college and just everything. And she had a, she had a great time. And she spent a couple of days at, at, at uh, Nickabungo you know, going back and forth and working and with the kids there. That's beautiful because basically um, those skills are needed and her skills to teach there, you know, teaching is not in abundance now mm -hmm. in Nakabungu. There's teachers, but not in like more is better volunteering yeah. <laughs> to help with the, very the medical center, like anything, mm -hmm. you know, so um, for people interested in visiting Uganda and volunteering, you can be in touch with uh, UDI and Anna can put the, the link uh -huh. in the chat. Um, and also young people here do fundraisers for uh, UDI as well in the uh -huh. high school. Yeah, uh -huh. correct? Yeah, the uh, Rotor Actors sponsor a child at, uh, a child at school also. Yeah. A Great. child at Tarima, I think. And oh, and, and uh, Mackenzie met that child in person. And she also met two of the, my members, well, Brian Whitney, again, who does our stock things when people want to donate stock. And he sponsors a child and Mark Perogo, um, uh, who's our foundation chair, I think it is, of our district, sponsors a child there. And she met those two boys and uh, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time, you know. And um, so it was, a, it was a real, you know, really interesting, you know, trip for her. Awesome. And also my friend um, Alma Fountain, who's been around since, you know, years and years, she's been to Uganda with me and she was going to go with me on my May trip I was going to make, but obviously that plan changed, but uh, we'll go again. And um, she, uh, she said to mention that, uh, you know, this work we do is not only, you know, the people that are doing it and the visitors that come to do some of this work really get something out of it. I always say I get, I get a lot more out of it than what I've put in, you know, and, um, but uh, I think that I think both Tiffany and uh, Mackenzie got something they'll remember always, you know. Thanks, Marsha. So in the interest of time, um, Anna, do we have the call to action slide? Um, we need to really encourage Rotarians before we move to the Q&A. Um, and everyone listening, that there is an opportunity for us to help uh, Uganda uh, for their medical, there's medical supply. So this is the summary of things that Rotarians and any generous person out there, even anybody can help and sponsor a, a child. Um, mm -hmm. It takes $250 to sponsor one. And I believe now you have 2,000 children who need sponsorship. Correct, Marsha? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We have 2,000 kids going to our elementary schools, and yeah, we mm -hmm. can we can at least sponsor one person at a time. Mm -hmm. um, here is the list. Uh, the primary school needs they they need to do repairs. Um, there's the high school needs. There's the university needs. Um, so, Marsha, do you want to go over the list and share with them what your needs are? Okay, well, I talked about the anesthesiology machine and an, another ultrasound machine. And then um, uh, with the primary schools, obviously it's 250 to um, sponsor a child there. Um, we, we have to get this new fence built um, for, for uh, Namorama because the, the government came in and put, like they widened the road in front of it um, 
and knock down our fence or our school that was that had been there and it's going to cost us approximately that you know about a thousand dollars to rebuild the whole fence to protect the kids from the highway so especially little kids don't go running out there you know well any school has to have a fence around it so um i'm sure you can imagine why we need that done right away and uh two thousand for just general you know repairs just you know these schools have some of these schools have been there for a while just normal things that any school here would do that they would be doing year after year after year, all the time and we have a little bit of catch-up to do um on on some of these so a couple of thousand for namorama and a couple of thousand dollars in repairs for for nickabungo because even though it was you know built well gosh it was built what what 12 years ago a lot of kids running all around in nickabungo and as anybody can imagine repairs need to be made um at the high school they have at the high school actually um which we, uh, rotary clubs in in um, england were quite active in that and and getting the high school built particularly in a place called hull england and with a man named uh, john rutherford who's a who's still involved with us today and uh, they did a big race over a bridge and made t-shirts and everything and they raised a whole bunch of money for that rotary club for the to get the high school built in fact he said he said when we were getting it opened he and i were there and it took took rotarians from three continents to get that high school built you know and um uh let me see this is something different yeah anna you is this uh, oh yeah okay, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. i got it. Yeah. okay <laughs> As I say, yeah, I just, I was, my phone did this or whatever. Okay. And then um, $10,000 or a donation of computers, you know, to get, you know, computers for the high school. Um, that, you know, would be great. And uh, university needs, uh, again, repairs to the university. And we need some um, more bathrooms built. I don't know how to put it any other way. We just need more bathrooms built at the university. And, you know, I'd love to get, you know, $15,000 or so to build more bathrooms at the university. And again, another 10,000 for more computer at the university too. Um, and the high school. Which uh, this is ultimate yeah, under the wish list right now. You know, I'm sure on my next trip, there'll be other things, but this is my, my current wish list. And those are all opportunities for service for mm -hmm. Rotary Clubs because they fit under the six areas of focus. We have uh, the maternal health for the medical supply. We have the education and literacy for the high school and the university. We have water and sanitation for the bathroom and university. So um, yeah, and, and also we, um, anyone can make a donation to United uh, Uganda Development Initiative. Uh, you can also start your fundraiser um that met to any of these areas that matter to you the most uh we can all sponsor a ugandan child uh education and please share this episode with as many rotarian and as many friends and as many good people you know out there to know about the needs of uh the people in uganda and the children in uganda and marcia is happy to talk to you invite marcia to speak so she can um, uh, share with you now in Zoom, um, she can uh, speak at any district or zone. Um, so ex have Marcia speak to as many people as possible because we really need to help uh, the children there and, and help um, uh, Kanungu and um, the wider Uganda because they need our help. So let's go now to Q&A. Um, thank you all for your patience. I just wanted to, uh, so the first question is from Rudy. Wistervelt, and he says, um, how might you connect with our newest peace center in Uganda? So there is a peace center in Uganda, how people may connect with that. I, you know what, I, I think it's a, a recent thing. Isn't that the Ugandan one? Is that a, a newer one? The Uganda Peace Center? I'm not sure. So you don't, I don't know when my next trip, I will definitely <laughs> go there and uh, see who to see who to contact about it. I personally don't have you know the information i thought it was like a new a brand new one that just got started but um i could definitely be wrong i've been known to be wrong once or twice at least you know and uh, <laughs> but that's great because so but i will definitely contact that center when i go back mm -hmm. and but it's really nice to know thank you rudy for highlighting this that there's a peace center there mm -hmm. because then the education yeah. is connected connected to peace so there's opportunities also for the peace area of focus 
especially mm -hmm. when Uganda is surrounded with wars and conflict and genocide. Mm -hmm. And uh, so be centered there for anyone interested in sponsoring um, contact. I just saw where someone posted that the Uganda, the Uganda Peace Center is new. Okay, someone just put something down there on the bottom. <laughs> Awesome. So uh, you have a question from uh, Vicky, Dr. Vicky Rattle. She says, are you still looking for sponsors for the children in Uganda? If so, what is the current cost of sponsoring a child per month, per year? Thank you for caring and loving heart, Marsha. Okay, well, it's $250 a year. And uh, you can go to the website or you can um, give me a check next time I see you, or you can mail me a check made out to Uganda, not to me, made out to Uganda <laughs> Development Initiative. Um, uh, and the website, I think you can make a don uh, do it on PayPal, say it's for a child sponsorship. And um, they give you a receipt from PayPal, like immediately, you know, you have to check your email and pull that up. And, um, and I think it's Alma, it goes to Alma's cell phone that she gets notified that, that someone, this person just donated X amount of dollars, you know. And um, um, so anyway, so it's $250 to sponsor a child for a year or any donation you want to make, you know, $10. Yeah. Is, we're happy for anything. <laughs> anything adds up. Yes, small donations add up. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question from Mark um, Harbison uh, from Hawaii. He says, have you considered adding a telemedicine uh, module uh, that would enable doctors, surgeons in central hospitals to consult on difficult cases. There are trained surgeons in larger cities. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's yes, a there, good idea. Yeah. 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 There are. Yeah. So I took uh, Kampala is a, has 12 million people in it. You know, that's where I took uh, Joanne to get her uh, surgery. And um, um, and there's even a larger hospital on Imperara. Um, it, we're just so new with the hospital right now that's on our list of things to do. Um, but the, the medical, the uh, surgery center just opened in uh, February. We just delivered our first C-section in February. So we're just really, you know, getting up and running. But I will definitely talk to Holger and um, about that. And also to Martin, who's there on site um, um, about that telecommunications. And I know, Mark, if you can email me directly and um, give me that information so I can refer it on to uh, Holger and also to Martin. I would yes. love that. We'd be happy con to connect Marsha and Mark after through um, after the... Uh, yeah, I know who Mark is and we have each other's emails. So oh, perfect. Can... Mm. Perfect. Awesome. Um, so another question from uh, Thomas Carlisi. He says, Marsha, I am impressed and inspired. I'm inspired by your angel of peace journey and the power of compassion and peace builders of actions, a Rotarians, Prince, a Rotarians, Prince of Peace Faith Community and others. As you were sharing Joanna's story from first living in the banana forest, second, the safety of the village, third, the challenge of Joanna's lump on her head, and fourth, the diagnosis and treatment recommendations was immediate surgery. I am imagining that Joanne um, was frightened and she was not familiar the, with the brain surgery. I'm guessing what you and others demonstrated deep empathy and care to assure Joanna um, that she can go forward and heal. Questions. Would you share what that experience was like for you? Additionally, please share how you and others offered information and reassurance that helped Joanne transform her fears to acceptance and successful surgery. So how basically, um, how did you feel through, throughout Joanna's, you know, struggles? Because, you know, she's one of your children and she matters a lot to you. How, how did you well, feel? I'm sorry, I feel, well, when I was talking about that uh, young Ugandan doctor, uh, this woman, and she, when she said that this is not an innocent bump, you know, she was conveying to me, this is bad news, you know, and, and I, you know, just felt a chill go down my spine when she said that, and she said she had to get to Kampala, and then um, this young, this young guy, 22, the 22-year-old with the two parents up in Cambridge who were doctors, um, when they got back to me and said she has to get to Kampala right away and get a surgery and everything, I was just, well, I'm trying to, 
jo Joanne, I was trying to be calm and oh, everything's gonna be fine, you know, but I was just like shaking. I didn't know what was gonna happen, you know? And um, so we got, we got her up to Kampala and then I didn't, I had, you know, I was at that particular time just busted, you know, and uh, when the people of Prince of Peace just started coming through and Sue Farron started, you know, sent a thousand dollars and, um, and this doctor, the Rotarian doctor said he would do the surgery. It was just like, um, it just seemed like one miracle after another miracle just kept happening, you know, for, for Joanne. And it was like, you know, I almost felt like I was in a movie or something. And then I was at the hospital and when she was getting ready to, you know, go in for the surgery and I was, you know, talking to her and also Annette who really kind of turned into, she was the woman that Joseph lived with and was, took care of the girls dorm and everything. And Joanne was very close to her and she, and Annette was there. And, um, um, so that was a blessing for me that Annette was there. And um, it was just, uh, you know, you know, she was going in to have this, I didn't know if she was gonna come out or not, you know? And it was, I guess, like anybody, any friend, any family member, anybody, how you would feel if any of you, had, if somebody was going in for brain surgery. And, um, it uh it was it was quite nerve wracking <laughs> to say the least and i was you know i was scared because i didn't know but i just felt like so many things had happened that for her to get to this point to have this surgery that she was going to definitely make it through this and and sure enough she did it's just like one miracle after another miracle after another miracle i've seen a lot of miracles in uganda i'll tell you that much yeah that's mm -hmm. beautiful thanks thanks Moshe. Um, our last question is from um, an anonymous attendee and he or she asking, um, are the children in school now, um, how are they doing during COVID-19 pandemic? Are they going to the school? No, the school, the school is closed unless they're orphans that are like living at Chirima, you know, but uh, just like everywhere else in the world and Uganda got completely shut down. They closed all their borders, you know, I could, you know, Americans can't come in, Europeans can't come in, nobody can come, you know. Um, you can't cross over from Rwanda into Uganda. And they even, uh, the president even um, closed down from city to city. Like you couldn't go, I think he just lifted that this maybe in the last few days, um, but you couldn't go from like Kanungu to Imbarara. You couldn't go from Kanungu to um, Nikabungo even, you know, uh, he, he kept all the city, the little towns and villages just isolated by themselves. So, um, you know, and it was a hardship because, you know, obviously there are some people that lost their jobs, just like here, kind of going through the same thing as here. The medical center is doing really well. And my Rotary Club um, get, uh, sent um, or made a check out for $1,000 to Uganda develop an initiative specifically to get the medical center um, PPE and they also were able to get some medications and stuff but they have masks and so they have all they have everything they need fortunately they didn't get a lot of sick people Uganda did not get as hit as hard as like uh, other countries as Kenya I think Kenya got pretty hard hit pretty hard but they were not allowing anybody from Kenya to pass in, into Uganda you know I mean, they wouldn't allow me to go to Uganda, you know, so, um, so he, they really shut the place down, you know, quite a bit. And, but the children are not in school. We're, we're just, um, they're debating, you know, I leave a lot, you know, to let, you know, let the schools decide when they should go back, the principals and the headmasters and all of that. And they're trying to figure it out just like we are, you know, here. And um, so they're going through a lot of the same stuff that, everybody in, you know, Wisconsin, California, Arkansas, Texas, that, you know, New York, everybody's going through. And even if your school does open, you're deciding, do I want to send my kid back, you know? So they're going through a lot of that same stuff. Mm -hmm. um, for anyone listening from Apple, Microsoft, or anyone in technology, 
um, maybe um, I know they have some programs and like they offer um, iPads for a remote education, maybe using internet or like have. So I don't know how they would do that, but if you know of anyone in these big companies who are willing to help uh, the Ugandan children's access education, because he, here we are privileged. We have Zoom and we have computers. Uh, people in Uganda, they don't even have a computer lab. So if anyone listening from any of these big tech companies and is happy to help, please contact UDI um, mm -hmm. and brainstorm a solution for children in Uganda to continue to access education. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to, I hate to end this, but I, I, for everyone who's watching, we will, um, to respect the time of the webinar, we will be wrapping this up in the next five minutes. But um, I would like to continue to talk to Marsha because there's a other beautiful story of Catherine that we haven't covered. And I'd like to, uh, to share that story and have it uh, available for people on live Facebook or for others who want to listen to it later on. Uh, but uh, the, we will finish the official webinar in the next five minutes. So uh, for that, I want to ask you my last question, Marsha, mm -hmm. um, about your dream. Uh, for your six children and the, and all the children of Uganda, you've uh, what is the dream that you have for them? Um, what do you hope for them? Well, it's the same dream I have for every child. First of all, they they grow up strong and healthy. That's number one. And as they grow up, that they still um, get opportunities and are able to to recognize opportunities. Sometimes that takes a little training, you know, to recognize an opportunity, you know, when you see one to maybe start a new kind of business that nobody's done before, or maybe a business that nobody's done in that area before or something. Or, um, but, um, you know, I think I have the same dreams for them that I have for my own grandchildren and, and, uh, but most of all, that they stay healthy. And now I know, uh, Joanne, by the way, just got married a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> She's just got married. And so if she has a baby, she has a place she can go and have a, a, a safe delivery. And if she needs a section, C-section, she can get one, you know, without having to find a car, get on gas and hope the roads aren't washed out and everything. So she still, she's there in Kanungu. And um, so that they, you know, stay strong and healthy and see opportunities. And I told them that, you know, I've, I've been helping you guys, you know, a lot. And I've told a lot of kids this, and I ex expect you guys to help other kids. You know, when you guys start, you know, are working and you're making money, I expect you to help other kids too. And, um, uh, and Joanne's already doing that. She's, you know, helping kids in school and all, and a couple of orphans. She's act literally taken in a couple of orphans that she takes care of. A couple of more orphans. She's always been been that <laughs> in that way, the motherly type, you know. And uh, even when she was eight years old, eleven years old. So those are my dreams for the kids. Thank you, Marcia. I mean. Um... For people who are hoping to stay, you're welcome to stay and listen to the rest of the story. There's a lot uh, more, uh, but for now, I wanna wrap it up for um, others who are expecting this to end at um, 3.30. So Marsha, it's truly, you are, you are the embodiment of what it looks like to reverse the trend of peace and equality um, in, in our world. Um, you saw the immediate and long-term needs of the Kunungu community. Um, and you also work tirelessly to fill the gaps um, through your work with the uh, UDI and establishing the seeds for the children and the local community to thrive for generations to come. Thank you, Marsha, for all your incredible work, caring heart. Um, now that you know Marsha's stories and the stories of these Ugandan children, uh, I'm asking all of you to take action and support the mission of UDI, no matter how small the action or contribution. We can all have, we, we all have the power from our living room because now we are enlightened and informed to take action uh, that care. Uh, please go to udiworks.org. Um, Anna will put it in the chat box and also on live uh, Facebook and for future YouTubers, 
uh, watching people who watch this on YouTube, the link will be there as well. Uh, to learn more about Marsha's wonderful initiatives with UDI and make a contribution for the wonderful ch children and families in Kunungo, Uganda. Thank you for joining us for another fascinating conversation on Together for Peace. With your generous and dedicated participation, Together for Peace has been a wonderful success in creating captivating conversations for peace building worldwide. Thank you for helping Together for Peace realize the power of turning our living rooms into platforms for positive peace, education, collaboration, and action. Please join us next week when we interview uh, Peter Kyle, the Rotary Director of Zones uh, for the Mid-Atlantic and the Caribbean, and former attorney for the World Bank. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, keep your smile big and your heart open. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone, and we each peace. So for those who would like to stay, you're welcome. And um, so now, um, Marcia, I am, we didn't get to talk about Catherine, but Catherine strikes me as a story of hope. Uh, she had the choice between hope and desperation, uh, but she found you. She walked miles and she found you. Can you tell us how you actually met Catherine for the first time? Well, I met Catherine for the first time on my very first trip. Um, when I went, when I was a missionary, when I went there as a missionary, and um, the six of us were taken out to um, Namarama, and <clears throat> um, we uh, we were taking we were there, as I said they were already starting to sponsor some kids there, and we were taking some pictures, and um, and the school is pretty little then, but uh, anyway. She had walked about three or four miles or something. She was six years old, six years old, and walked by herself like three or four miles to come to the school because she heard that some people who might sponsor new kids would, uh, you know, uh, might be there. And she walked that way just to take a chance that somebody might be there that might sponsor her. And so obviously I didn't speak Ruchiga, but she was speaking to one of the teachers there and said, oh, she walked all this way to uh, try to see if somebody would sponsor her. And I said, she, this little tiny thing walked all this way. And I said, well, tell her she's got a sponsor. <laughs> and uh, so um, that was my first meeting with her. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Later, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, she is. Yeah. That was like my first trip there to Uganda and my first meeting. and. Uh, she was very thrilled to, um, you know, get a sponsor, and there she is sitting on my lap. <laughs> and I think I had something in my purse. I, I can't remember what it was. I had something that I left left with her. I gave gave her something, I, some little knickknack or something I had, and um, um, and I said, "Then don't worry. You know, you're you're going to go to school all the way. You know, and." Um, so then I saw her again when she was seven, and then she looked pretty good, and then I saw her when she was, you know, eight, and, um, oh, there's some other trip. <laughs> saw her when she was eight, and when she was eight years old, if you can imagine an eight-year-old that looks exhausted and deeply tired and has bags under her eyes, and uh, Kellen was there, and uh, my friend Kellen, and I said, what's, you know, can you talk to her and find out, you know, why she so t looks so tired and looks so, uh, you know, and she looked real thin too. And um, uh, so Kellen talked to her a little bit and she said, you know what, I think we should uh, go out to her home and let's check, let's check on, see what her home looks like. And her mother was, was at home. And um, I think we, uh, oh, I remember. And she said, what you can do is maybe leave uh, some money for the teachers to go out and get some, uh, some goats. And, we can, and then the, we can have them taken to her mother because maybe she needs more milk or something. And if you, it's not like you run to 7-Eleven or something and get some milk. No, you have to milk a goat out there <laughs> to get milk. And so um, I left some money for, uh, with one of the teachers and he said he would go get some, he, he knew some good goats and he'd go get them today and take them out there. And um, I said, okay, fine. He knew where Catherine, he, well, all the teachers know where all the kids live, you know. 
And so then we stopped to um, uh, buy her some shoes and also uh, the pair of shoes for uh, uh, my friend, um, uh, Lisa Weiss, who's been sponsoring this one girl, Anna, since she was little. And I was gonna buy Anna some shoes too. And so we were, you know, in the little town of, Nic of Namorama. And then the people were coming up to Kellen and telling, Kellen, telling Kellen that her father was a real jerk. He was making her work every night after school until real late and he wasn't feeding her and he was taking the money she was earning and taking it and he was, you know, doing other things, you know, he was buying booze with it and all this stuff. So Kellen was getting all this in outside information, you know, as we were buying shoes. And then sure enough, we were getting back in the car. We we're going to drop Anna off at her house and then go out to, uh, to, um, to uh, Catherine's house. And the father, the father came up, up to us in the car and started speaking. And he was evidently say, telling, saying to Kellen, she said, oh, I hear you're giving some money to some teachers to buy the goats. Well, don't give the money to the teachers. Give the money to me and I'll get some good goat. I'll get the goats, you know, so give me the money. And Kellen wasn't having any of that. And she's very, you know, she doesn't take much of anything. And she walked around and she told him that you, the, we're getting the goats. The teachers are getting the goats. We're not giving you a dime. And uh, that's all there is to it. And you walk away. And these goats are for your children, you know not for you. And um, so anyway, then we went out to the house. We left him in town and went out to the house. We talked to the mother and for a mud hut, it was very, it was actually very cute, like something out of a fairy tale or something that mother had, you know, just wildflowers kind of all over that she'd picked and everything. And there were two other babies there. There was a, you know, like a one, a baby that was a, t a few months old and a toddler. And and we talked to the mother, and then we saw this other boy who was older than than Catherine, and he was like the thinnest child I'd ever seen in my life. He was about figured twelve or thirteen at the time, and his his legs were like sticks, and his face was just completely drawn drawn in and everything. And he said, "What's who's who, you know who is this boy?" And that was Catherine's older brother. So. And how old is he? And we found out from the mother. And then Kellen said, you know what? With this father situation, um, I think we had that other school, Charima, that was, uh, you know, down the street from Kellen and um, uh, in, in Canunga there. And she said, I think we should take the children with us and put them in Charima and have them board there instead of coming home at night to the, where, the, where the father is. And then sure enough, the father showed up. And he saw, oh, and then the teacher showed up with the goats and the teacher had gotten a, a, a female and a male goat and there were two infant, two baby goats too. So these goats could last a while. And Kellen said, as the baby goats get bigger and she can milk, the mother can maybe even sell milk and make some money too. So they can make, so they can have these goats going on for a while. You know, this is good. And the father saw them, got this big smile on his face. And Kellen said, now I'm gonna send a teacher out here every week and these goats better be here if these goats are not here you're going to be arrested you know these are not your goats these are your children's goats and uh, they do not belong to you and blah, blah 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 and just went off on him and so then he walked away and Helen said that he in their tribal kind of thing he was he realized that he could not have domain over those children and those goats and so he was like that he would get in trouble if he sold them and that he was just walking off all in a huff, you know, and everything. <laughs> but they kept checking the, those goats hung around. Those goats were there for a long time. You know, they kept checking. Yeah. And um, uh, so anyway, we got, his name was Africano. And so we got them and then again, went into town, got them beds and everything, you know, to live at the dormitories at Tarima. And I said, what about, you know, the mother? What is, how does the mother feel about this? You know, is walk, driving off with her two oldest children. And she said, the mother is extremely happy for her children and relieved that they're gonna be taken care of, you know, that yeah. the father can't get to them. She was, she was relieved about that. And um, 
So anyway, so Africano started school, he was 13, started in first grade at 13. And he turned out to be really good at math. He's graduated from high school now, and he's going to uh, the college. And he's really good in math. Awesome. So, so, mm -hmm. What struck me in that story also is, and your writing, you, you share how the dad had weight on him. And he starved his, you know, he, uh, all, you know, so Africano and Catherine would access uh, meals in the school, but that was not enough for the labor. Yeah, he, they, he, they, yeah. she couldn't eat enough calories to, to keep with her, her working until like midnight. And Africano had just worked all of his life. He was 13 years old. And that's all he knew was working in the fields. And, uh, and let me just say the, uh, the father, he's like, you know, here, here in the United States, we have some parents that are just not very cool at all. We all know yeah. that, you know, but, you know, and 99% but of the parents are great people. And it's the same, same thing in, in Uganda, 99% of the parents are great people and they want the best for their children and they work real hard to try to get the best for their children and uh, in difficult circumstances and everything. So he's one of the 1%, you know, yeah. and, um, I've met a lot of parents and they really work hard to keep their kids in school and feed them and stuff, you know, but, um, so he's the exception. And, um, but, uh, yeah, he, yeah, she couldn't eat enough calories at school, you know, they have rice and beans and Portia and they sometimes they have vegetables that they've grown, you know, but, um, uh, to, to work like that. So she couldn't keep weight on her and she was exhausted exhausted all the time yeah the picture and, we saw of them they didn't look happy yeah that photo yeah, yeah. So she just didn't look happy and she looked exhausted and bags how often do you see an eight-year-old with deep-seated bags under her their eyes you know yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so Catherine what I love about her story is that she chose to she chose education um, uh -huh. as, as a way she had she had hope and she looked for the White people, what do they call the white people? Um, mm -hmm. Mazungus. Mazungus, yes. So she found you. She's so smart. She found you when she was six years old or four? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Yeah. So she found you. And then although her circumstances at home continued to be bad, she chose to go to school every day. And that's like three, three miles walk, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, um, and then um, you've helped in in the process. She helped her brother Africano. Now both of them are in, in a boarding school with you. Well, after Catherine's graduated from college. She decided ultimately to take uh, in college um, Echo um, Agriculture, wow. and so she she's like managing a. Well, she was before COVID. I don't think anybody's doing much of anything right now, but uh, managing a um, a farm you know, with what she's learned in college and being eco ecologically, you know, correct. They're big on ecological stuff out there in Kanungu. And, um, and her brother who is older than her, but behind her in school, because he didn't start till late, he was 13. He's in college now. Yeah. And he's, wow, this, is, this well. is a beautiful story. And that just, to me, this is the embodiment of positive peace because you created a structure for these children and in the school, uh, the structure and the system and the way you change their attitude. Because if they didn't have access to school, how do you expect them to grow up under these circumstances? Uh, even if they even managed to grow up, because I believe Africana almost was on the verge of death because his yeah, dad- Yeah, you can, can't even tell how thin he is in that picture. That, that, that was when I actually found him. Someone, I, I think, yes, I took that picture, um, but his, his little, I mean, his shoulders were hardly even there. It's like a head sitting on top of bones and yeah. his arms are so thin. And it was just like, I took one, look at this boy. I said, who is this boy? You know, I did, I probably would have taken him if he hadn't been, <laughs> you know, your brother. But uh, um, uh, when I found out it was Catherine's brother, it was no brainer. I said, well, we have to get him to school. And Kellen realized we had to get him away from the father. We had to get them both away from the father. Yeah, because yeah. that's domestic violence, basically, yeah. and child labor. Yeah, and he wanted them to work because he had this other family. He was yeah, also a family. colleague. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, which, which 
goes back to the to investing in women and development like mm -hmm. so when you give the goods to the mom also you've uh -huh. supported that that uh, model um women yeah. Have, yeah and i might add that all these young what catherine joanne just got married at 25 and um um all these young women they're they're trying to get careers anna um they're putting off having children until till later, you know, when they're a little more, get kind of established, where if they hadn't been going to school and had just been doing like generations, like most of their mothers, they would have had four or five kids by now, you know, at this age. Yeah. And um, the average Ugandan woman has seven children. And the, um, um, you know, they have seven children and it just stopped the cycle you know, education stopped that cycle. And also all these girls, you know, Catherine and, and all of them, they're only gonna have two children. They're not gonna have seven, they're gonna have two because they wanna be able to educate their own children and they want their own children to go to college, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's beautiful. So literally the sponsorship will change, um, change their lives and create those continuous miracle and change Uganda because mm -hmm. the president of Uganda Tell us about that. So the president noticed well, what you're doing in this small town that was so remote, nobody even knew of it in yeah. Uganda itself, probably. And then this is becoming the model for Uganda. Yeah, well, now Uganda, I told you this one man told me that nothing, or nothing good could ever happen in Kanungu on my first visit there. And yeah. it was such a depressed area and all. Nothing good can ever happen in Kanungu. And now people say good things happen in Kanungu all the time, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and from all the people in England and Europe and you know, Germany and the United States and California and all the rotary clubs and, you know, just, it's, it's been a, a, a world effort, you know, <laughs> to make all these things happen. I just happen to go there pretty often, you know, more than most, but, um, um, it's been quite an experience, but this whole, area is doing really well it was what about the it was the worst area in one of the most depressed countries still recovering from Amin and stuff and and the Lord's resistance army up north and um and everything and um it was just like this depressed place and now it's like one of the best places and I got contacted by um some of the politicians like know me and stuff because I've spoken places and things in Uganda and I got this message got to me that uh, the president wanted to see me on this trip I guess somehow the president of Uganda found out I was there you know and, uh, <laughs> and he's the president he would know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he wanted to speak with me and um, um, the uh, and Bob um, Smith who you know he was on that trip also Bob's been there twice has been to Uganda twice. And um, uh, we love that too, because he was with me. <laughs> and um, um, but the president was uh, very nice to me. I thought we were supposed to have like 15 minutes. And um, we were there for like a lot longer, like over an hour, like an hour and 15 minutes. And he was very, very nice to me. And he was asking me about this, that, and the other. And he gave me some books. Actually, I've got the phone sitting on one book that he wrote three books about Uganda, and he would like to have me work on museums there, 12 different museums in Uganda, you know, but uh, um, he gave me some books and he signed them uh, to Marsha from an old man on the equator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Uh -huh. Um, so, uh, Marsha, also because of all the things you've done, you were honored. Uh, you're now Dr. Marsha Hunt. Yeah, Dr. Yes. Marsha. <laughs> so tell, us, tell us about that. Yes, well, I'm not taking anybody's appendix out anytime soon. So, just to make sure. <laughs> I have a doctorate of letters from the Kumba University. And I got this, this e I got an email. I was just checking the, I was working and, you know, doing the shoots and doing what I normally do and got this email from this Nakumba University saying they would like to honor me with a doctorate from their university and would I accept and could I, could I come and accept it in person and all of this. And so I emailed them back saying, yes, I can accept it in person. And uh, 
when do you want to, they told me it was October of 2018 or November, I forget the date. Uh, oh, it's on my thing here. Um, the 20th day of October of 2018. And, um, and Mackenzie Casey from UCLA was there with me when I got it, you know, she, she was on that trip. And um, so it was like a scene from Chronicles of Narnia or something, you know, it was at the regular graduation for that school. So there were like 2000 people there. And um, they gave me this, this red, well, you can see it there, this red uh, big robe, which they told me <laughs> to keep because on certain occasions I will need to wear it, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know what occasions I'm going to need it to wear it here, but, uh, um, but I have it and um, they'll inform me if I need to bring it to Uganda for certain occasions, you know, and, uh, but it was like a scene from Chronicles of Narnia or something because they had me walk down this red carpet and they were talking about me as I was walking down. It was like, it was like choreographed, you know, and, uh, um, and then I had to, they told me what to do. And when you get to the front, in front of the chancellor, you get on your knees. I had to like get on my knees and bow and uh, put my head down. And he changed hats. I started off with a black hat. And then he put the red hat on, the chancellor did. And then he took some, I'm not exactly sure what it was, but it's like, I was being nice and he touched me on each shoulder like this, you know, like this and, and so I, I didn't know what to do. And then I, they, I had to go give a speech afterwards to everybody. <laughs> After and, all um, this the whole, whole, the whole thing, the whole 2,000 people and all that. And um, so anyway, so it was like a, I felt like I was in a scene from Chronicles of Narnia or something. That's beautiful. And you know what I love this story? because you, this is the indication that you're doing the right kind of development, which is to be involved with the people. People invited you, they wanted to honor you because they love you, they trust you. They, um, it's not like you show up as a stranger and you do your mission and you leave. You've been going back and forth like multiple times a year, like four, three times a year. Uh, oh, usually about twice a year, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I should have been there twice. I was probably going to go three times this year. I should have been there twice already. So as soon as everything's, if, as they say, back to normal, whenever that's going to be, <laughs> I'll, I'll go back, you know, <laughs> and do everything I was going to do in the last two trips. Awesome. Well, Marsha, do you have any last thoughts for, before we wrap this up for the people who remained uh, watching? Thank you all for staying. See, people stayed. There was 12 people. There was earlier like 16 who stayed. Like they really enjoyed the time. yeah but stayed on oh my gosh yeah, yeah. well thank you all for staying on <laughs> um any last thoughts oh just that you know I, I have to say again that i i've gotten more out of it than i you know put into it and just to you know seeing these kids grow up and um you know becoming healthy smart accomplished individuals, you know, and I think of where their paths might have gone, you know, um, has been something. And also, I found out about Rotary while I was in Uganda. I didn't join Rotary until I think it was 2000, when did I join? 2009 is when wow. I joined Rotary. Yeah. So wow. I've been there for a while, but I saw all these Rotary signs all over the place all the time. And started thought, oh, I should check out this rotary and I found out there was one right at UCLA right by where I lived <laughs> wow. so so I've joined rotary in 2009 so that's what 11 years ago and I've been the president and you know I've been traveling for rotary too I always I like to go to the conventions as you know <laughs> and, and, um, um, so it's been a, a you know good for me and um, certainly it, let me just say this much. It certainly makes life interesting. <laughs> you know, I could talk for three days. I won't. But uh, I've had a lot of experiences. And I can't imagine my life with, without all this. It would have been pretty boring, I think, you know. Yeah. I remember from your writing uh, something that stuck with me. I found it adorable. I found it in inspiring. I found it very much like Marsha. You said, like, how you, you won an, an Emmy. So you're a big shot. And then you've uh, shopped at all these uh, fancy stores. But for you, what was so uh, 
the most uh, rewarding shopping you've ever done was uh, shopping for the shoes and the yeah. and the clothes, and the, the clothes, and the bedding and stuff with these with these with these four little kids and you know getting their shoes, getting all their bedding, getting soaps and toothbrushes and you know, <laughs> all this. That was the most fun shopping trip I ever had in my life. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, that's that was beautiful, and ju that just sums you, Marcia. And, um, and I'm so glad that Rotary is doing amazing work around the world to attract members like you who go to places to help and see the Rotary sign and say, I want to be part of that. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you for joining. I'm uh, um, so happy that we've had this conversation. And for anyone listening still, sponsor a child, reach out to UDI. Um, and um, the links are somewhere under the video. Uh, to donate, to contact them for volunteering, visit Uganda, be in touch with Marcia, ask her to speak. You know what you need to do to help people in Uganda. Uh, share this with as many people as you can so people know Uganda needs and empathize with the people there and the children there. Marcia, everybody loves you. I love you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're an Thank inspiration. You give my email out to anybody who asked for it you know at the okay that's the, great to know for the rotary action group for peace you know awesome okay so we will follow up with the um with the audience and um uh share the the email with everybody okay yeah, great okay. okay well have a great afternoon and evening and happy weekend okay you too thank you bye-bye